adoration is a word that we love to use during the Christmas season. Thanks in part to the classic carol, O Come, All Ye Faithful. We sing those words, O Come, Let Us Adore Him. So many of us during the Christmas season spend more time thinking about Christ than we do at any other time of the year. More people go to church during Christmas season than at any other time of the year. And we also tend to find ourselves singing and listening to songs about Jesus. Even on contemporary radio stations, have you noticed? I've been listening to B106, Christmas music ever since before Thanksgiving. Christmas music, 24 hours a day, nothing but Christmas music. And I was amazed and touched. They didn't just sing jingle bells and silver bells. And it's beginning to look like Christmas and baby is cold outside. But they really did sing songs about Jesus. Songs about Jesus. Christmas is a time that we love to praise Jesus, honor Jesus, adore Jesus, much in the way that Philippians chapter 2 describes. Paul wrote, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. But despite the wide frame of the hymn, nothing certain is known about the origin of O Come All Ye Faithful. It was originally written in Latin. Much guesswork has focused on John Francis Wade, who made a living by copying and selling plain chant and other music. He lived in France, where there was a large colony of English Catholics centered around a famous college. And Wade made known all the copies of the manuscripts dated from 1746 to 1760. But whether those lines were his own or whether he simply copied them from another composer, we do not know. What we can safely say is that the hymn and the tune came together in the services of the Roman Catholic Church during the first part of the 18th century. At about 1786, a Duke of Leeds happened to hear this very carol in Portuguese, and he introduced it in the Portuguese hymn at the Concert of Ancient Music of which he was the director. The misnomer is still retained in several old hymnals. It is a favorite carol that summons the Roman Catholic Church together, and it summons us together this day. O come, all ye faithful, let us sing this ancient hymn. Verses 1, 2, 3, and 6.
This next carol remains one of the most well-known, and in my opinion, one of the one of the most theologically filled Christmas carols. The song was written in 1739 by Charles Wesley, brother of John Wesley, who founded the United Methodist Church. He wrote this beautiful hymn. Charles still holds fame for writing over 6,000 hymns, along with the lyrics of over 2,000 more. And some of you may recognize his hymns. I know Jim does. And can it be that I should gain? Christ the Lord is risen today. Jesus, lover of my soul. And one of my favorites, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Despite us not recognizing all of this, Charles Wesley's deepest desire was not that we knew him, but that we knew his Savior. He desired to help people learn the Christmas story and to learn it not just as a sweet little story, but to learn its true meaning. And so he penned heart the herald angels sing, wanting us to understand the doctrine behind the biblical story of the angels' chorus. When Charles first wrote the hymn for a Christmas Day service, he arranged the lines of the song a little bit differently with slightly altered lyrics. He wanted the tune to be consistent and slow and solemn. And a few years later, in 1753, Charles's friend, George Whitfield, changed a few of the words from Wesley's original words. Wesley's words were these, Hark how the welkin rings, glory to the king of kings. Do y'all know what a welkin is? He's referring to heaven. George Whitfield, thankfully, changed the words to hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. But he further cut the last two verses, which few people currently include in the song. The pattern was also turned from 10 to 4 line verses to 8 lines with a chorus. Charles Wesley was not pleased with this, that somebody would mess with his poem and change his song. But I think without those changes, it wouldn't be as popular as it is today. In 1840, Felix Mendelssohn wrote a cantata in honor of the anniversary of the invention of the Gutenberg Press. And several years later, organist Dr. William Cummings put these lyrics, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, to that music of Mendelssohn's to form what we know today as this beautiful and uplifting hymn, 
The first publication of the current version of the song occurred in 1856. And whether it's placed at the end of movies like Charlie Brown's Christmas, or It's a Wonderful Life, or whether it's used in church services or heard on the radio, this Christmas song is a staple this time of year. The song reminds us that Jesus is not just the newborn king, but Jesus is the prince of peace, the son of righteousness, the everlasting Lord, the incarnate deity, and best of all, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus coming as the second Adam, born that we may no longer face death. God, God's self, in human flesh, what wonders this song proclaims, the doctrine behind the biblical story. So let us stand as we sing this beautiful hymn, Heart the Herald, Angels Sing. seated. <clears throat> when the angels first sang about peace on earth and goodwill to all, the shepherds must have wondered what was going on. They certainly didn't hear an angel's choir every day. And in first century Palestine was hardly a peaceful place. The streets buzzed with rumors of revolution and tension often boiled over into violence. Society was split along lines of gender and race, wealth and religion, and the shepherds themselves were only a few rungs above beggars on the social ladder. They were outcast and often considered outlaws. For some of us, Christmas is a time to be with friends and family. But for others, it reminds us that we are alone and separated from loved ones. Over 2,000 years later, we seem to be as far from heaven on earth 
as they were in Palestine that day. Many people in the first century were expecting a quick fix to the world's problems. They thought the Messiah would come and peace would reign that very day. But of course, that didn't happen. And we still pray for that peace to come on earth as it is in heaven. In the United States, in the middle of the 19th century, the relationship between the southern and the northern states was tense, as you recall, over the issue of slavery. This was also a time of the Industrial Revolution and the Gold Rush, and young Americans were struggling to grow. And in the process, they were losing their concern for others as they looked out for themselves. During this time, Edmund Hamilton Sears, an American preacher, carried a heavy burden because of the social injustices in our country. Sears wondered how the birth of the Christ child fit into 19th century America. As he read the story over and over again, he was moved by the message of the angels, peace on earth. Was that the message that the people of 19th century needed to hear again? That peace was yet to come and that it would come? From Sears' deep concern came this carol. It came upon the midnight clear. In this carol, Sears reminds us that Christmas is God's promise to bring in a kingdom where wars and injustices and even death will be a thing of the past and where we will live together with God and in harmony with one another. That's our hope. That's our faith. In the meantime, God continues to show God's love to us in many ways by providing for our needs, by answering our prayers, by inviting us to start today to live as kingdom people, to love one another as Christ has loved us, to show compassion, and to show unconditional acceptance of others today. Once again, I tell you, I am so proud of this congregation that y'all understand that calling, that y'all stand up and show that compassion and work against the injustices that God's kingdom may come to earth as it is in heaven. For in these ways, we can experience a foretaste of the new heaven and the earth, new earth right now. We can share that experience with others who are hurt, with others who are lonely, with others who need the message of hope and healing. And we can do this all in the knowledge that God's kingdom will prevail and that the whole of creation will one day see the truth that those shepherds heard about on that remote Palestinian hillside when it came upon a midnight clear. Let us sing this beautiful hymn. Thank you. 
There are many interesting fables about the origin of the next carol that we're going to sing. And I understand that most of them are fanciful and untrue. Many of these anecdotal stories claim that Pastor Joseph Moore of St. Nicholas Church in Germany wrote the words on December 24, 1818, in order to provide guitar accompaniment for a carol for Midnight Mass because the church organ, like ours, did not work. But theirs, so the fable goes, is because a mouse ate the bellows. Actually, Reverend Moore wrote the words two years earlier as a poem. And on Christmas Eve, 1818, he thought it would be nice to have a new carol, and he thought his poem could be set to music. He hurried off to see his friend, Franz Gruber, who was a school teacher and also served as the church's organist and choir master, and he thought maybe he could help, and he did. In a few short hours, Gruber came up with a hauntingly beautiful melody that is so loved and revered today. And at the request of Reverend Moore, Franz Gruber composed the music for guitar accompaniment. That night, Gruber and Moore introduced Silent Night to their congregation as a song that was born to anchor their Christmas celebrations. While no romantic background story exists for this beautiful carol, the impact of this lovely tune has been worldwide. It has been translated into over 44 languages. Silent Night could well be the most popular Christmas hymn of all time. Its lullaby-like melody and simple message of heavenly peace can be heard from small town street corners in America to magnificent cathedrals in Europe, and from outdoor candlelight concerts in Australia to palm-thatched huts in northern Peru. The English version we sing comes from 1863 translation by the Reverend John Freeman Young, who was elected bishop of the Episcopal Church in Florida in 1867. And as a testament to the power of the hymn's message, Nearly 100 years after its composition, on Christmas Eve 1914, during World War I, the French and German soldiers celebrated the holiday by declaring a truce for that day. These enemies came together in no man's land, exchanged presents, buried their dead, and ended the night singing Silent Night together in their own language. It was one of the few hymns that had been translated into both of their languages. Let us sing this beautiful melody together, Silent Night. Thank you. 
Christmas just isn't Christmas without silent night, is it? It gives us a feeling of security and contentment. Like so many other carols, it takes us back to the peace and quiet of that stable. And as long as the baby Jesus is there, what harm can come to us, right? But Jesus is not in that stable any longer. Jesus didn't remain a baby. He left the stable. He grew, and he learned, and he told God's story to all who would listen. If Christmas is to be all that it is meant to be, we too are called to leave the stable and to grow in our faith and to learn, to love, and to share. We must move beyond the silent night into the fullness of the day. We must tell the story of Jesus, the Savior, to the world. We've heard the Christmas story over and over again these past few services. And I think that most of us know that Christmas story by heart. We don't even have to look it up in the scriptures. We could just recite it. But do you ever think about how the story really got to each one of us? Started with that song, didn't it? That song that the angels sang to the shepherds to go and see this newborn king. And when the shepherds left the stable, do you remember how Luke tells us that after they had seen the Christ child, they went and told everyone? what they had seen, that it had been just as the angels had proclaimed. The Christ child grew, and others came and got to know this Jesus. They heard his preaching. They witnessed his miracles. 
They watched how he loved and cared for others. And after his death and resurrection, they too began to tell others about their experience of this man and his love and his message. Just a handful of people knew what had happened, and yet churches dot the globe today. You can find Christians and followers of Christ on every continent. More people hear about Jesus as a teacher and a healer from their friends and their family members than they do anywhere else. More people come to know Jesus as their Savior and their friend from their family and their friends than anywhere else. But it all started with the angels singing and saying, Go and see, see for yourselves this miracle of God's love and of the disciples and the shepherds and others sharing that same message. So this Christmas, I want to encourage you to go forth into the new year, sharing your faith with others, asking them to come and see, to come and hear the message of God's love and witness God's grace in this community of faith. For we are called to sing the angel song all year long. Let us stand as we sing our commission, Go Tell It on the Mountain. My dear friends, once again, thank you for being here today. I wish each one of you a Merry Christmas as I send you forth into this beautiful day. Go forth in peace, love and care for one another in the name of Christ. And may the Lord keep you safe and fill your hearts and your homes with those gifts of hope, peace, joy, and love. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Did you have your babies with you? You too. Thank you. Thank you.